This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 643, recorded on August 13th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. I don't even know what the weather is. We got too much to do, so I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Good to see you again. <laughs> Just saw you Good yesterday. You again. We'll see you again day. tomorrow. Today we have a special episode. We have a number of guests uh, from most of them from the UCLA School of Medicine. Maybe one other person from Duke who might pop in later. We're going to talk about their idea about a safe way to open school. So let's uh, introduce them. Uh, so I, I always like to look at my Hollywood Squares, which is, of course, the Zoom screen. All from UCLA David Geffen School of Medicine, uh, Mary Seal. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Uh, Ken Lange, welcome to TWIV. My pleasure. Alfonso Landeros, welcome to TWIV. Hello. And Janet Sinsheimer, welcome to TWIV. Thank you. We were just Thanks talking so in the pre-show about how, well, we, Robert Sinsheimer, a famous virologist who is not related to Janet, but Rich and I thought of, of him immediately. So uh, the, the purpose of this uh, episode is a MedArchive preprint that has been co-offered by uh, these individuals called An Examination of School Reopening Strategies During the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. And we thought this would be uh, an important manuscript to dissect uh, for our audience and uh, it could be spread to schools who need some advice. So let's start first by asking, like, what in your backgrounds prompted you to uh, undertake this study? Maybe we could start with you, Mary. So uh all of us here are mathematical biologists. We're interested in mathematical and statistical models applied to important problems in biology. Um, we mainly focus on cancer modeling. Um, I'm a hematologist and oncologist, but uh, Janet uh, and Ken have extensive experience looking at viral models as well and modeling um, viral transmission and um, combination therapy in different viral settings. Um, and once the pandemic hit, all we could think about was um, how can we help? Mm -hmm. And I have two little kids, age nine and 11, one of whom is in elementary school and the other one's just starting middle school. And so this is an important question on my mind as they've been home getting too much screen time. And um, the models that we've been looking at are the classical SEIR models, susceptible, exposed, infected, and recovered with an added um, feature of putting in a force of infection component that models an increased transmission rate during the hours the children are at school. So when these questions of reducing transmission in various ways came up, we thought it would be a good idea to compare and quantify mm -hmm. what would be the reduction in risk by the different proposed methods. Uh, so how, how did you get this group together? Do you work together typically, or did you just run into each other in the hall before there were halls to run into? <laughs> we do work together. We work on uh, cancer models, population dynamics, extinction models, and um, had lots of conversations. We we noticed we stopped talking about cancer and started talking about right. coronavirus and its transmission so around mid February. Of, all of you are, are faculty. Alfonso, you're a PhD student, is that correct? That's correct, and this is actually most of my dissertation committee here. So ah. we we all meet regularly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you can record this. This can be your defense. <laughs> How close are you to done? Yeah. Uh, well, I just finished up my fourth year, and this would be my fifth year in the program. I'm hoping it's my last. All right. What a heck of an experience in your I'll dissertation, say. right? This is a once-in-a-lifetime. 
Yeah. <laughs> it's um, been a little bit of an adjustment, but, you know, most of my work is on a computer anyway. Yeah. So working from home wasn't too crazy of an idea. It's just, you know, it took a little bit of adjustment as, as it did with everybody else to right. get into a routine to be productive every day. <laughs> and uh, Kenneth and Janet, I'm interested in what each of you uh, bring to this that's uh, unique to the project. You want to go first, Janet? Sure. Um, I'm really, um, Mary called me a mathematical biologist, but I consider myself more of a biostatistician. And um, so typically I'm the one in the group that says, uh, these mathematical models are nice, but how can we uh, relate them back to real data? Okay. Ken? Well, I'm by training a mathematician. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mary was one of my graduate students. Mary, Janet, and I are sharing Alfonso. Uh, so we have a very long history together. Okay. And uh, how uh, this particular project, when did it uh, start up? This summer, uh, in our discussions, transferred from cancer to COVID. And uh, I would imagine that this entire thing has been virtual, right? Have you ever yes. met face-to-face on this? Not for months. Okay. <laughs> I think it's remarkable how uh, science is proceeding in in this lockdown um and if you think before computers and internet this couldn't have happened we would have been in big trouble right absolutely yeah so uh you mentioned the susceptible exposed infected removed model okay so uh understand that uh i'm i'm clueless uh <laughs> this sounds like a standard epidemiological model for looking at disease. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what, what, do those, what do those terms mean and how do they factor into the model? So loosely speaking, uh, these types of models are termed uh, compartmental models where you effectively uh, are looking at a particular population. It can be a country, a state, uh, or a community in our case, a school community. Um, and you effectively partition that population into groups of people based on infectious states. So you have a susceptible uh, subset of that population that um, is susceptible to infection of the virus. And you also have uh, two components that uh, account for latency in infection. So that's you have an exposed group that becomes exposed to the virus, but doesn't necessarily uh, transfer the virus to other individuals. The infectious individuals are driving the viral dynamics in the model. And finally, the removed compartment just deals with people who are removed from the infectious population or the susceptible population. Uh, either because they've been physically removed or they're immune? Yeah, exactly. We we, we intentionally kept uh, the number of compartments simple in this because you can generalize this. to so you, you can account for um, having different groups of, of removed individuals, but you can okay. explicitly account for deaths or um, oh, right. hospitalizations. Okay. Uh, but this this is a generalized removed category. Yes. So, so these four compartments then are non-overlapping. Is that right? But That's together, correct. But together comprise the whole co- uh, population. Exactly. Um, and uh, you then specified uh, forced... I think the word forced was used. Uh, yeah, the force of infection, uh, okay. which is quantifying, if you were to try to interpret this as a, as a physical model in terms of physics, um, the force of infection is the exertion from the infectious population onto uh, the susceptible population. Okay. So basically, you have, uh, you have this model which you... Um, used to compare infection rates, and you do it in children and adults under different scenarios, which we'll go into. Uh, that's everything I said right so far? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And then one of the key parts, as you say in your manuscript, previous work suggested that a cyclic attendance strategy tuned to the latent period of SARS-CoV-2 may con- curtail secondary infection. So can you explain that? Yeah. Uh, we looked at a uh, this preprint uh, from a group in Israel, I believe, mm-hmm. 
um, that was looking at you know strategies to try and reopen um, the the economy essentially. So they they were looking specifically at um, you know working adults, and they weren't accounting for um, any level of uh, age stratification or anything like that. But the the, the whole premise of the article is that um, by thinking about when people are actually able to transfer or affect other individuals, um, depending on how you cycle people in and out of the workforce uh, through these quarantines, you can you may be able to curtail the effects of, of of the pandemic while still being able to reopen the economy and have people back in work. So the latent period is essentially the incubation period, the time between when you encounter virus and then you uh, have symptoms, right? Well, th- I think they were trying to make the distinction between. Um, no, sorry. Uh, yeah, they they, were, they made the distinction between uh, incubation and latent period, but that's exactly right. It's it's, but the, the you want to account for when you actually are infectious. So you may be infectious yeah. before you show symptoms. Right. So it's actually in the point when you start to transmit. Uh, yes. Which m- may be about a day or so before symptom onset, if I understand uh, the literature. Correctly. Okay. So now a key part of this modeling is a is a rotating cohort strategy, right? That's correct. And so you have, um, in the case of the the work from the group in Israel, you have uh, people rotating in and out. In our model, we have uh, cohorts of both adults and children that are kind of rotating out. Mm-hmm. Um, the adults don't necessarily represent individuals in the school they account for other people as well but it's really the children rotating rotating it in and out and the people which who with who they have contact with that are also playing a role in this so this was something that i had a uh, i can't really get my head around in the study and that is why uh there are two different populations considered and what the dynamics are there because you talk about adults and children the adults include both school teachers and staff and would that be uh, people in the community or parents and stuff as well absolutely so it's anybody that uh children in a particular cohort have contact with and why are they segre why not focus the model just on the uh children and what why why divide it into these two groups uh, well, there's there's been the question of whether uh, children are able to effectively transmit the virus to other people, right? And so we wanted to kind of incorporate that into the model um, by having uh, transmission rates that explicitly account for transmission between adults, between uh, between children, and between adults themselves. Okay, so now that makes more sense to me because you've got you've got this parsed out in various graphs where uh, it's. Uh, considering whether it's transmission among children, among adults, or between the groups in either direction, right? Exactly. We wanted to see how the model is sensitive to different choices of parameters because um, we do not have any data to put to this. Not to say that the data doesn't exist, but we, you know, at, at this present moment, we wanted to just kind of look at how does this thing tick. Okay. Just for the record, here on TWIV, we are of the belief that uh, children can transmit, not, uh, not only amongst each other, but to adults, in, in contrast to many people who seem to feel that it doesn't happen, but they do shed Absolutely. virus. So I think you're all in line with that, and uh, that's reflected here. Um, so you have the, the rotating cohorts are in five days, out five days. Is that correct? Um, it's yes, the, 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 the weekend is modeled in, in, in our, in our simulations. So it's in five days, uh, rest for two days and then return to. So actually you've got two different cohort models, right? You got both parallel, uh, cohorts where one group goes to school, the other group does not, uh, and rotating co- cohorts with either two or three groups where you rotate two groups or you rotate three groups, and it's by week, right? Yes, that's correct. Um, we included the uh, non-attending version or the non the, the parallel cohorts to account for uh, an option where people opt up to just stay home and keep the children 
uh, either learning through distance learning or hiring private tutors or whatever solution that they saw fit for that. So having people get having the option to uh, not send children to school as well. So it's uh, I have a hard time uh, picturing this as well because uh, do you uh, the in the parallel cohorts mm -hmm. are the. Per, the, it seems to me the parameters would be different for the kids in school and the kids at home, right? Or the transmission yes. would be different. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a, a multiplier effect that's incorporated into the simulations that accounts for children being at uh, school versus not being at school. Okay. So that's how it's folded in there. Um, but I wouldn't say that, you know, we're modeling an explicit mechanism. It, it really just is, you know, turning a knob on, on a on the simulation to incorporate the effect that you would expect. Mm -hmm. But we want to caution that this isn't something that's super detailed, like an agent-based model where you're explicitly accounting for movements of people or a uh, very, very fine level of detail between individuals. Uh, so, but by the same token, the adult populations are not really, are there different parameters applied to them depending on whether they're parents or school staff? Uh, no, we, we don't explicitly model uh, the adult staff at a, okay. at a school. Fine. Yeah. So tell- And that's, that's done. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. You can finish. It's fine. Um, I, I just wanted to say the- it's a simplification in the model, in part because we're dealing with something that is deterministic, um, meaning that, you know, if we run the simulation another time, we're, we're not going to see different outputs. We're not a, a accounting for individual variability. That's a level of detail that can be accounted for in a mathematical model, um, certainly. But in addition to that, uh, I would also add that because we're working with something that is a continuum model, meaning that we're measuring uh, these infections and in populations by percentages um, or, or fractions of the population, uh, it becomes important that we um, are wary of, of very small numbers appearing in the, in the model, right? Like it's possible to get a, you know, 10 to the minus six for a particular population. And then when you think about what does that translate to numbers of people, the interpretation changes whether you're talking about a school with uh, a thousand students versus a hundred. So I think uh, it would be helpful at this point to tell us how the simulations worked, how you, you use different uh, conditions to predict the number of infections. And actually, the, I think an important point is when you, when you stop, there's going to be a point when you get above a certain number of infections and school has to close at uh, a stopping point, right? So how do your different uh, rotations uh, play into that? Right. So in the, in the beginning when we're talking about um, uh, the effect of reducing density through these through, uh, separation and cohorts, um, one of the main effects of doing that is that you're cutting down the um, reproductive number. So the number of mm -hmm. secondary infections due to, to uh, susceptible uh, to due to an infectious individual. Really, what you do when you split the population in half is you're almost cutting that number in half mm -hmm. in our model. So that's that's one way to interpret that you're cutting that number down in half. Um, and it, it's not uh, depending on what your your attendance policy for school is. You're increasing the amount of exposure or context between uh, children, right? So if you're having children attend five consecutive days, their transmission rate, so from child to child, is going to be higher during those five days compared to any other time uh, of the week, whereas the cohort that's staying at home has a much lower transmission rate in our model. Um, I think we use a, a multiplier of 10. So if we have a baseline rate that we use and then we multiply that by 10, to uh, model the effect of children attending school. Now, if you switch over to the parallel cohort um, uh, strategy, then you have children attending school full time in our model. So they're, they're going to school five days a week. They have an elevated rate of transmission during those days. It goes back down to normal one during the weekend. But the parallel cohort, which 
has very little interaction with the other group of, of students, um, has different, uh, much lower transmission rates due to not having that contact. So what we end up seeing is that just keep, you know, it, it's not so surprising, uh, just keeping people apart, uh, you know, is going to reduce the spread of infection but there is a little bit of a distinction between the parallel versus the rotating strategy in terms of what that means for the educational experience of children. Mm. And so um, it, along with the, the rotation, you also you know, look at face masks, desk shields, hand washing, surface cleaning, improved ventilation, right? You factor those in as well? Yeah. So then we we also have another set of simulations where we look at, well, what's the effect of trying to reduce uh, transmission? Uh, we say that reducing transmission directly in the sense mm -hmm. that you're trying to, you know, you have people coming into contact, but you're somehow providing some shielding from that, from, uh, from those contacts, right? You're wearing masks, you're cleaning surfaces. Uh, so we wanted to quantify the effect of those types of interventions. And what we find is that, you know, you can achieve a similar effect to keeping people apart, but it requires a rather remarkable level of uh, uh, reduction to achieve the same effect as, just, as, as opposed to just keeping people apart. Yeah. So as I recall, the way you model this is that you say, okay, well, consider that a given procedure like face masks is either... 20, 40, 60, or 80% effective in knocking back transmission, right? And see what the effect of on the model of any of those is. But it seems to me that uh, do we really know how effective any of those things might be? It seems like it would, uh, uh, um, that it's uh, a little more accurate in a way. You, you kind of easier to predict what the effect is of cohorting people i mean you can you know because when two people are apart their transmission is zero okay but if you put them together whether or not they're wearing a face mask eh, i don't know if that's 20 percent or 40 percent. so it seems to me that the mitigation procedures is a little squishier in the modeling than the cohorting is that am i seeing this correctly yeah absolutely like i, I wouldn't uh tell anybody that you know we we predicted that you know wearing face masks, face masks is not going to be as effective as keeping people separate by, you know, this amount of, of reduction in, in infections. Like we, we, we would really need to fit the model to data and we would have the whole issue of trying to quantify the effect of, of um, people wearing face masks in the model as well, right? Like even if we can't fit data, we are not going to get the we, our model cannot measure that. You need to design a study to measure so it, that. Yeah, so it seems to me that, uh, yeah, you could say that, well, if face masks were X percent effective, you could have you could anticipate that uh, this would be the effect on, on the model. I wonder if you can do the reverse uh, and say that uh, if we were to compare plus and minus face masks in this modeling scenario, we can come to a conclusion as to how effective the face masks are. I guess that's pretty obvious, yeah. Another part of, of this is testing, right? Obviously, there has to be some testing, yet not all schools are able to test. I mean, my school district doesn't permit testing at school. Uh, it has to be done at home. And so how does that because you're obviously, if you have a certain percentage of kids, uh, if you're cohorting and rotating, as you suggest, you're going to have to test to see who's infected and decide when to stop, right? When to shut down. You have a certain number. So how does that work? How does the testing work? And I'm sure it's different in every school district to a certain extent. Right. So we, we structured the simulations for testing uh, based on uh, California's recent guidelines on uh, reopening schools. And just, just briefly, uh, the, the way that this works is, is we have a stopping rule. So we say that after the percent of infections in children reaches 5%, mm -hmm. uh, we're going to close down all the schools in, in, in the model, or we're going to shut down the, the schools in our model. And what that translates to basically means that the transmission rates for in the model basically changed to that of the P 
people not attending school. So that contact mm -hmm. multiplier mm -hmm. is is going down. Like that. What we find is uh, that having this sort of policy does end up um, reducing the infections, but it's contingent on schools having access to testing resources. Yeah. So the way that yeah. it's modeled uh, in our simulations is to basically test every single day. So every day you're sampling the number of, or, or the, the percent infected, and you're removing those individuals from the model. So they're going into the removed compartment. So, now, so, so obviously that's not... You don't sorry, test, no. you don't just test sick kids, you test randomly, right? Uh, well, the, 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 the model has perfect information about who's infected, right? So it's not, it's a, it's a very crude approximation to mm -hmm. what you can actually do. And it's, you know, it's, it's done deliberately because this is, you know, if, if you could test everybody exactly and have perfect information, this is what it looks like. It's a very yeah. um, crude upper bound. So from a practical point of view, it's, I understand that there are, have been instituted recently guidelines issued guidelines in California uh, that uh, that implement this stopping rule, right, at 5% infection. Is that correct? Yes, but it's based on a 14-day window. Uh, okay. And, and is there, just once again, in a, real, in a real sense, is there help in California for determining what the infection rate is in the school? Uh, or, uh, is there help from the, from the state uh, in implementing testing, or uh, is everybody kind of on their own? Um, maybe Mary might have more insight into this. If we were functioning the way we are now, that 5% would be based on children getting sick or their parents getting sick and going for testing and being identified that way. Okay. But it is a dream or, or, or potentially reachable goal that we would be implementing testing of asymptomatic individuals and incorporating that. LAUSD is a very large district. And so uh, proposing something like that is something it's, it's a large goal that would take a, a considerable amount of work to, um, to be able to tackle. So in the current, thing. in the current scenario, that's not happening. Yeah. Not at this point. Okay. But I, we're think, hopeful. I think that's the okay. situation. It's at most. important to, yeah. Go I was going to say, it's also important to note that in California, most schools are remote right now. Or will be remote yeah. okay. for, quite, for at least several weeks, if not longer. Okay. So, um, in in my school district, they are going to do a, a daily rotation. Some kids in the morning, some kids half in the morning, half in the afternoon. And after reading your manuscript, it seems to me that that's a bad idea. What do you have? You modeled uh, more frequent rotations. It's something that I played around with early on when I was starting the project to see if, you know, I could get something interesting out of this or if it was worth, well, worth pursuing. But um, I didn't, I couldn't tell you right now what the results of that were. Okay. Um, we chose the, the weekly strategy based on um, the previous work of trying to tune to the latent period. So if you have people, the, the idea being that if, you know, they're rotating out five weeks and then they come back and you test them as they're coming back, you're, uh, going to have a greater likelihood of catching those infections. Right. So we've got uh, then several different variables. Uh, we got uh, cohorting, either parallel or rotating, and mm -hmm. we have various mitigation procedures, right? Masks, hygiene, social distancing, et cetera. Did you start out and say, we're going to try all of these individually, independently, and see what works best? Uh, have, what was the approach? And in the end, what does work best? What would be the recommendation based on the model? Right. So we do have the simulations with just the cohorts and just the trans changing um, the transmission rates due to mitigation. And what we find in the end of our, of our simulations is that uh, just keeping people separate ends up being the most effective strategy because A, it's the most realistic. Like it's, it's in terms of, you know, achievability. Um, if you want to go the route of masks, you need everybody wearing masks and everybody buying into the, the, the thing. Otherwise, you know, the weakest link is going to uh, spread the infection and it's going to spiral out of control from there. 
And in terms of the cohorting strategies, which is the most effective? Uh, most effective? We didn't see a huge difference between the two. Um, the between parallel, parallel and rotating. Yeah, we, we don't see a, a big difference in the uh, infections, but we do see or we, we speculate that one is probably more realistic to implement than another. Um, there is a whole issue with uh, distance learning in that, you know, it's not necessarily a substitute for in-person instruction. It can be, but it requires, um, you know, people pulling together resources to really make that a, a effective learning experience for children. So in terms of the benefit to the kids, the, rot this, um, uh, the rotating strategy would be a better idea so that everybody gets some face time? Is that the idea? Provided that there are testing resources available. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Because it also struck me that in the parallel model, it's interesting because I would assume that the kids that don't go to school uh, have uh, a lower infection rate. But I guess, you know. Depends what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, if they stay uh, home. They don't yeah. have the benefit of having the, you know, the social interaction and the FaceTime as well. It's, I mean, I, uh, hard to imagine how that would be divided up, uh, in a real, in a real sense, how you would put people in those different pools. Maybe it would just fall out from people saying which pool they wanted to be in. Yeah, uh, that, that was our, that was our, this was based on a survey that went out early in the, in the summer before decisions were made about our district opening or closing where parents were asked questions would you come back if there was half of the school attending? Would you come back if a third was attending? So based on different densities, or would you only come back to LAUSD if it was um, if you were offered the option of 100% um, virtual learning? Mm -hmm. And what came, what came out of that survey? Shortly after that, within a day or two, there was a decision to make it completely virtual. I don't know if that survey, okay. um, <laughs> um, but um, one of the reasons why we wanted to model masks and other um, decreasing um, transmission strategies uh, differently is because there is controversy about whether children learn, particularly younger children, if they can learn as much if their teacher has a mask or if their fellow mm -hmm. students have a mask, because a lot of learning is done by facial recognition mm -hmm. uh, of patterns. And so there's an argument that um, if they were to go back with masks, that might not be as good as being able to see their teacher on the screen, um, certain, certain types of learning. Mm -hmm. So was there an attempt to uh, separate out the different mitigation procedures like masks and distancing and et cetera, or are they all kind of lumped together as uh, let's consider mitigation at 20 or 40 or 60% just as a, as a, as a concept? Yeah, they're lumped together because uh, trying to incorporate that level of detail in the model like this requires, uh, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't want to do that without any data on hand. Uh, well, and that was my next question. Are there data that would inform those uh, uh, different uh, decisions as to, you know, how, how, how good the mitigation procedures are individually or collectively? Uh, well, we, I came across a couple papers trying to quantify the effect of masks. And all I can say is that people are looking into this question and they're, they're designing studies to try and tease that up, apart because we also have, you know, people have been in quarantine and social distancing. So you have the two effects kind of playing out. It's not as straightforward to tease out the effect. Well, so that's interesting because that even supports better the whole cohorting thing because that's, that's known. You know what happens when you separate people. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, well, or you have a better idea, put it that way. Is that fair enough? Yeah. yeah. So in the best scenarios, you eventually reach a stopping point no matter what, where you get enough infections where you have to stop. And I think five weeks was um, the, the most you could get. The idea being, okay, at least kids are in school for five weeks. Uh, then you have to stop. And the stop, of course, depends on being able to test uh, and determine, right? So there's no scenario where you go more than five weeks? 
Oh, well, that's not, that's, I, I wouldn't say that because mm-hmm. we chose the parameters in, I, I take it you're referring to figures three and four in, in the yeah. manuscript, right? Uh, we chose the, the parameters for the simulation such that okay. we would have outbreak conditions. So we were expecting to see um, uh, closures and in, in, uh, schools closing in the model. Got it. Um, t- again, to kind of provide an upper bound because, you know, there are people taking all sorts of precautions and there's no reason to believe that it is impossible to uh, reopen, but it's contingent on being able to do all of these things. Like in, in our, in our model, we assume that schools have access to all these testing resources, Mm -hmm. but how realistic is that at this point? And then at some point instruction in person instruction can resume when infection rates drop below the stopping point. Right. So the idea would be you go back to school again, or is that not the way it works? Uh, we didn't include that in the model, but that certainly is uh, the thinking be to- be behind some of the uh, guidelines, including California's okay. announcement. Yeah. Okay. So may- maybe we can. S- I-, I want people to be able to come away if if they if they can't read the paper, come away with a recommendation. So what can we? What is the, the recommendation that you would make? Because I think you want to have a concrete outcome, right? Of your of your paper. What would you say to people, Janet, or? or Mary or Ken, what's your recommendation? What should people do? Yeah, the parallel, the or rotating co- cohorts are are effective. Mm-hmm. The people have to will to implement them for it to work. And there's huge differences in communities across the United States. In New England, upper New England, this conditions are much more conducive to opening schools. In the Deep South, that's not true. So the local circumstances have to be taken into account. So you mean because of different rates of infection in those areas? Yeah, right? In the outside world, yes. Yeah. Okay. But a rotating cohort of five days in and out, is that what you're suggesting? Well, one of the two, they're both kind of, well, yes, well, we didn't find that much difference between rotating and parallel, but it's all about reducing uh, exposure rates, reducing the density of the classroom. Mm-hmm. And so that's the key, not face masks, not distancing, not hand hygiene, the main that's recommendation. That's yeah. understanding. Uh-huh. Mary, that's you agree with that? Yes, the combination of cohorts plus um, available testing Mm -hmm. is far more effective than wearing masks with large um, groups of people in a classroom. Interesting. And um, if you could test every student every day, cheaply, quickly, that would be the ideal situation, correct? Janet, Mm -hmm. you, you would agree, Janet? Definitely. I also want to say, though, that using masks, using the mitigation strategies, even in these smaller cohorts, has a big effect. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we did see that even in the models that we could reduce the, the levels of transmission even further. So I don't want people to come away from this thinking, oh, well, if we just have smaller uh, classroom density, um, we can go back to uh, pre-COVID um, interactions, right? Okay. But I think if parents were worried that their child couldn't keep their mask on effectively, we can at least quantify what that um, what that outcome would look yeah. like. No, I, I think you have a good discussion in the manuscript about how in some kids won't be able to keep masks on. And in some cases, it's important to see the teacher's face and so forth. And I think that's all important to consider as well. Um now, and again, this is going to vary depending on where you are in the country. But the other is, I mean, will this work for elementary, high school, and college universities, you think? That's something that we discussed modeling as a follow-up to all of this. Mm. Um, just just based on what, what we've done so far, I would say that that probably is uh, a we, – we have enough reason to believe based on our modeling to uh, – suggests that, yeah, this this could be an effective strategy in reopening uh, universities. Yeah, because many, uh, obviously, many universities have their own st- 
strategies and they involve some distancing, but testing is a very minor part because they don't want to pay for it <laughs> for the most mm -hmm. part. Uh, many universities require you to have a negative test before you can show up on campus, but once you're there, you're not going to be tested unless you get sick. And that's an issue because once you get sick, then you've already infected uh, many other people. So um, I just don't see how this all works at all without good testing, frankly. Mm -hmm. I agree. So I have a, I don't know if this is the time for this, but I have a sort of a general question. Sure. Because I'm not sure that the lay public really appreciates or understands what modeling is. Okay. I'm not sure that uh, the man on the street can discriminate between or not, does discriminate between modeling and real data or, or, or whatever. So I appreciate you're all modelers. Okay. So I'd appreciate some discussion of say how you would, uh, you know, describe to uh, your neighbor who's not a scientist or not a modeler uh, what modeling is and how it can be used. Anybody want to tackle that? I'll go ahead and start and make a fool of myself. <laughs> uh, so um, I, I think of modeling as, as a way to kind of play out uh, thought experiments or what if scenarios and quantify them. Now, that's That's the key part of this. It's a, a way to carry out a, an experiment, um, either through computer simulations or whatever, you know, you, you try to come up with a, a model that describes something that you're interested in studying using first principles or inspiration from other fields. Um, and the whole point is to kind of just play out, okay, we, we have this model, we have these parameters, how does it tick? How do, what, if we change this aspect of the model, what sorts of outcomes do we see? Um, you know, how sensitive is it to different parameters? And that's, there's kind of an art to, to these things because you can come up with models of say um, gravity, right? And that's something that's pretty well understood to the point that people call it a law. Whereas what we have is, I wouldn't say that's a law. I wouldn't say that our model is um, a perfect picture of what reality actually is, but it helps us understand how these different um, mechanisms, if you will, separating people into cohorts or um, reducing transmission directly, how those things kind of play out in, in these outcomes. Yeah, so it seems to me, I, I get the impression, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm just, you know, talking here, uh, that it's, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I, I wouldn't say concerned, but I think that some people look at models and they say, oh, this model says that this is what's going to happen, all right? Whereas I think it's more like uh, the model says that if you were to change this parameter or uh, variable, uh, I'm, oh, this could happen, but if you were to change this parameter or this variable, it might have this sort of an effect, okay? It's more like looking at what the impact of different behaviors are on a potential future rather than necessarily predicting precisely what the future is going to be. Is that a fair perspective? Yes. There's a saying in statistics that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Right. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> and so we rely on data as they come in, but we would need schools to reopen to really get a good idea of what those parameters are. But we um, we're hopeful and optimistic that our models will be useful and more useful at that point. And so it, it is uh, in terms of actually uh, doing the modeling, it seems to me that there's going to be, in terms of your input, there's going to be a mixture of assumptions and data. Is that, is that fair? Uh, and uh, so what sort of, uh, how does that mixture play out in what you're doing now? How much, uh, what sort of data are used and uh, uh, what uh, sort of assumptions are made? So we chose a fairly wide range of parameters to look at these, um, our predictions in multiple dimensions so that we can 
vary the different parameters uh, quite a bit so that we're not dependent on, on a parameter to look at the sensitivity to these parameters. Um, but um, I would assume that it's structured so that as data come in, for example, on uh, the effectiveness of masks or mm -hmm. whatever, you can plug it into the model and say, ah, now we got a real number that we can put in the model and see how that affects things. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. So, sorry, go ahead, Mary. I was going to say exactly, but I'm glad you're answering it. <laughs> um, but I'll add to that that, um, you know, modeling is uh, an iterative procedure. Sometimes okay. you, you, you know, especially for, for people that work uh, closely with experimentalists, uh, you know, if somebody's telling you, you know, your, your model doesn't match up with our data, you have to think about, well, why is that the case? You know, I, and I, I, I don't feel comfortable generalizing here, but I want to say that more often than not, there's probably something wrong with the model that needs to change. Mm -hmm. So this is always an iterative procedure. There always needs to be uh, feedback between people that are looking at data, people that are measuring things, and people trying to come up with these um, uh, mathematical abstractions. I want to read a couple of sentences from your manuscript because I really want listeners to be able to take away what it is that they should be doing. So from the, the end of your introduction, we find that reopening schools at half capacity by running either two parallel cohorts of in-person and remote learning or two rotating cohorts of in-person learning is likely to have a greater impact in controlling virus spread than direct measures that mitigate transmission risk. That is, reducing the number of density of contacts produces a larger effect than diminishing, diminishing the transmission rate per contact. Our models also suggest that regular administration of rapid surveillance tests, even with imperfect sensitivity, can significantly delay uh, disease outbreaks. So that's the bottom line. And, and schools can determine whether they do, you know, rotating or parallel um, cohorts and how much testing as much as they can do unfortunately and by this you think you will be able to get some weeks of uh instruction in before you reach the termination point or stopping point as you call it is that a fair message to send to uh listeners yeah i would i would say so now but of course it requires a lot of uh coordination between different sorts of people yeah, the one point I wanted to make is that we've done the easy part, right? We've compared these scenarios, yeah. we've confirmed some things that maybe were intuitive, but now are more quantitative. But the really hard part has to be done by a lot of administrators, mm -hmm. right? They've got to figure out how to make these things practical. So, Is this uh, sort of modeling, has this been done previously for SARS-CoV-2? Uh, there are other groups that have uh, looked at similar questions. Mm -hmm. um, we came across a paper after the fact um, from this. Um, I don't know if the group is based entirely in Washington, and maybe somebody else remembers, but they were certainly working closely with Kings County and at the state of Washington to um, use an agent-based model to look at the effect of different uh, uh, policies as well. So the group is the uh, from the Institute for Disease Modeling out of Washington and Bellevue. Mm -hmm. They used mm -hmm. a different approach, but they came up with some similar I, uh, ideas about the um, the effect of children uh, transmitting, even if they tr transmit at a lower level. Uh, it's another very interesting uh, modeling. Uh, I think the name of the paper is uh, uh, "Children Are Not an, an Island" or something to that effect. They should. I'll pull it up in just a second to give you the name in case people are interested into looking at this question in a different way. It seems that it's, uh, well, it's, it's mid-August. A lot of schools are started already or have their plans in place. Uh, it, so maybe at best these findings would give confidence to school boards to say we're doing the right thing. Or if they're not, they can reevaluate uh, and change uh, as quickly as they can. Um, I mean, we can help you get this information to a lot of listeners, and if they find it compelling, it'll amplify and go out from there. So it's a good thing that we can talk about it here. But um, if if people want to contact you by email to talk about this and get ideas, can they? Can they do that? Yes, you're all good with that? Yeah. 
Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So the paper name is schools are not an, an are not islands. We must mitigate uh, community transmission to reopen schools. And that's a, a slightly different question than ours. And I think it's very important though is mm-hmm. to remember that we're not advocating opening schools where the transmission rates sure. in the general population are high. Um, there's been several studies, uh, one that was uh, highlighted from the University of Texas in the New York Times about how dangerous that could be as well. So the, what we're talking about is a situation when the baseline rates are low enough to start reopening mm-hmm. schools. In some places they are, of course. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw in Georgia in the past weeks that schools opened and they had almost a thousand infections within weeks. And I suppose they didn't do any reduction of classes. I'm not sure. Does anyone know uh, if there were class size reductions there? Didn't look like it from the hallways. (laughs) (laughs) And I think the thing to think there is that those children were already infected before they, that's not, I don't think that was child to child transmission. I think that's (laughs) what what was happening is that they were so soon that we saw Mm -hmm. these uh, children being inf- uh, were infected. That this, and in fact, were children who had been infected uh, during their summer break. Got it. Right. So the infection rate was too high to resume. Essentially. Okay, Janet. I know you have to let go. Me, let me just add that we're willing to share our software, mm-hmm. and if people can help us improve it, that's certainly something we would welcome. Okay. That's great. Uh, Janet, I know you have to leave. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Okay. Bye, Um, everybody. Bye-bye. I think we have covered it. Is there anything we missed that you think is important to get out there? Um, I think we covered uh, the the major points from the paper. But uh, I would like to acknowledge that, um, you know, a lot of this this work is built on the shoulders of giants there are lots of people that uh, certainly made the simulations possible there mm-hmm. we we use um, a we use a programming language called julia that's uh, a very important uh, component to being able to do our simulations well because it's uh, it's really available it's open source um, i just kind of want to highlight that you know that a lot of uh, Computational work relies on having access to good computational tools, reliable Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, computing software. Go ahead, Mary. I was just going to mention that Alfonso's code is user-friendly. So if somebody wanted to um, implement it and they didn't have a a very strong modeling or coding background, Mm -hmm. um, we're optimistic that it can be helpful and useful. Okay. So we will obviously put a link to the Med Archive uh, manuscript on our show notes. We will put links to your websites and then people can get in touch with you. Uh, and I think, you know, many schools, uh, officials may want to talk about uh, the right way to do this. And so that you can be of great use, I think, in that in that aspect. Okay, I think that'll do it. Let's um, say goodbye. That's TWIV 653. Um, perhaps um, a safe way to open schools with with covid-19 we'll see actually if if people do this and i think this will be done in many schools this uh cohorting the data will help you improve your model obviously right yeah i was thinking it would be nice to revisit this sometime <laughs> yeah. in the future um and you know you say something that's you know they, you say basically we're going to have to do this until there's a vaccine which is true but i'm not sure that the vaccine is going to necessarily help. I just don't know if they're going to have durable protection for enough people, but that's another issue altogether um, in the meanwhile. Anyway, that's TWIV 653, microbe.tv slash TWIV. You'll find the show notes where links to the manuscript and everyone's websites. If you have questions or comments, TWIV at microbe.tv. If you can't get in touch with them, send us the email. We'll forward it to them. And if you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently residing in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. This is great. Our guest today from uh, UCLA, David Geffen School of Medicine, uh, Mary Seal. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ken Lange, thanks a lot. We're great fans. Thank you. (laughs) Love to hear it. And uh, Alfonso Landeros, thank you uh, very much for joining us and talking about this cool work. Thanks for having us on the show. And of course, Janet Sinsheimer, 
Our your colleague from Duke never showed up, but that's fine. We got everybody's lot. busy. Everybody's busy. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>